the crew here. Study Torah together. And it is amazing mm -hmm. to be at another opportunity of Torah studies with you all on yeah. this Wednesday, June 23rd. All right, Torah portion this week yeah. is Balak. So I'm going to mute everybody and let's talk about Balak. So here's the deal. Balak was a king who wanted to get rid of the Jewish people. I know it sounds like a familiar story. And the way he, uh, the way he wanted to go about this was by hiring an evil prophet, a prophet for profit or a prophet for hire. This guy, the prophet, the prophet was named Balaam, or in Hebrew, his name was Bilaam, Bilaam, Balaam, just don't call him late for dinner. Either way, this guy was all about bad news. I mentioned today on Daily Power Parsha. Hey, Olya, welcome. I mentioned today on our 12 o'clock, our 12 noon DPP. If you're not on it, get on it. It's amazing. So I mentioned today that Balaam was actually one of the three original advisors of Pharaoh who came up with his, I guess we, we could call it final solution to... Um, to try to kill all the Jewish babies, all the Jewish boys that were born by throwing them, throwing them into the Nile River. The point is that Balaam had a longstanding history of anti-Jewish kind of sentiment. And so here, as the king of Moab, as the king, um, as, uh, as, as Balak, the king, panics because of the advancing Jewish people, so he calls upon this nemesis of the Jews, Balaam, to curse the people. Balaam, I'm just going to give you an overview of the parish, and then we'll jump into our topic. Balaam, there's a bit of a negotiation. Till, will he agree to the job? Will he not agree to the job? There's enough money put out there that he eventually agrees to the job. Okay, so Balaam is hired. His job is to curse the Jewish people, and he tries three times. And three times, he opens his mouth. He wants to curse, God forbid, the Jewish people. Out come blessings. The Torah portion toward the end of the portion tells us that Balaam decides on his own to give one more blessing. At this point, he probably realizes it's going to be a blessing, not a curse. He decides to do, to do it one more time. And he talks about in this final message, he talks about something that is quite marvelous. And this proves to be one of the only times in Scripture that we find this topic clearly, sorry, one of the only times in the five books of Moses that we find this topic addressed. And that is the topic of Mashiach, the Messianic era, or the person known as Mashiach, the Messiah. So let me give you a little bit of info on, on Mashiach, um, and then we'll, we'll get back into, into Balaam and the prophecy and look at the verses. All right, so here we go. First of all, we just wrapped up a six-week JLI course all about Mashiach. So if you were in that course, you're good to go. I mean, we still have more stuff tonight, new stuff tonight, but you'll, you'll have a lot of the background information that you need. But if you didn't, and you may know, and you may know otherwise, but if you didn't and you need a, a quick primer, here we go. There's a fundamental Jewish belief in the Messianic era, a, a time in which the world will be a better place. Materially, spiritually, everything, it's going to be a utopia, kind, kind of like a utopia. Um, you know, not magic, but but just a perfected world. It's something that we believe in, something that we're striving toward. And to, to a part of this is the person known as Mashiach, the Messiah, who will help usher in and, and guide this era into fruition. So that's the quick, quick primer. The question is, and, and maybe you've thought of this before, maybe you've even asked this before, the question is, how do we know about that? How do we know about any of this? Where does it say that Mashiach, where does, where does it talk about Mashiach in the Torah? Fair question? Is that a fair question? So now I say, where, where, where's the origin of the notion of Mashiach, the Messiah, the Messianic era, in the five books of Moses? Where do you see it? Fair question. So there are some allusions, not illusions with an I, allusions with an A. Um, for example, in the, uh, the Song at the Sea, it says, Az Yashir Moshe, then Moses will sing which is an allusion to a future time, resurrection of the dead as well, which by the way, hey Paul, welcome, uh, which by the way, resurrection of the dead, we're starting a brand new course next Thursday night called resurrection of the dead. Don't miss this one. This is not a redo of an old course. This is brand new. We are not resurrecting an old course. 
this is a brand new series. I'm sorry about that. Anyway, getting back to the point. So the question is, where do we see Mashiach in the Torah? It's a reference, future tense regarding Moses and its sinking. So we have this idea that Moses will come back again, Mashiach in the Messianic era, whatever. Okay. But one of the clearer references to Mashiach is in this week's Torah portion from an unlikely source out of the mouth of the enemy of the Jewish people, the evil prophet Balaam. He talks about Mashiach. Where? Let's look at the verses. All right, I'm going to open up the verses. Oh, and let me tell you the, the objective of today's class, to understand the prophecy of Balaam, the messianic prophecy that's the, the, the clearest messianic prophecy in the five books of Moses, to understand what it says, what it means, and extract some life lessons from this. All right, that's the goal. Let's jump in. I'm going to share my screen, and we will look at the verses together. All right, Steve, if you don't mind, Steve Horowitz, if you don't mind getting us started, um, this is a quote from the book of Numbers 24, 17 through 19. We have three verses of Messianic prophecy. Take it away, Steve. I see it. Uh, but not now. I behold it, but not soon. A star has gone forth from Jacob, and a staff will arise from Israel that will crush the princes of Moab and uproot all the sons of Seth. Edom shall be possessed, and Seir uh, shall become the possession of his enemies, and Israel shall triumph. A ruler shall come out of Jacob and destroy the remnant of the city. Thank you. Okay, so this is really important, and I want to go th slowly through these verses. But one thing that I need to tell you is that in the preamble to this, and I wish, you know, I, I wish it would have been um, cited in this text, in this book. Um, uh, Balaam, the prophet, announces that he is going to share what is going to happen at the end of days. He talks about, actually, hold on, let me see if I have, yeah. I have, I have in front of me Chayenu. Don't leave home without it. You guys know Chayenu? This is good. This is like your one-stop shop of all... Uh... Oh, Steve, I love it. I love it. You're matching my Chayenu with a Chayenu. We got matching Chayenus. Amazing how that works. Love it. By the way, if you don't know what Chayenu is, because like Chayenu, like what's Chayenu? Chayenu is daily Torah study, printed. You hold it. Very textile. It feels great in the hand. It's got everything you need to study Torah each and every day, comfort of your own home, on the train. Anybody ride a train here? I don't know about that, but like you just put it in your jacket pocket. You're good to go. Put it on your desk. Keep it at your house. Um, take it with you. Waiting in line. You got your chayenu. You're good to go. I want to tell you what it says in the preamble. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to read it in English, but, but listen. Balaam the prophet says, and now I'm going back to my people. Balaam says, all right, it didn't work. I can't curse these people. I'm going to go back home. But before I go, come, I shall advise you what to do. And I will tell you what this people will do to your people at the end of days. That's literally what he says. He says, I am, go Balaam, the prophet says, I am going to tell you what this people will do to you and your people at the end of days. End of days. Hello. That is messianic. Right. End of days. That's a euphemism or that's I don't know if euphemism. That's a that's a reference to the end of days, the messianic era, the uh, uh, the era of Mashiach. And what does he say? So that's the preamble. But look, I, I kept this text up for a reason because I want to go back to it. So what does he say? So Balaam says, I see it, but not now. I behold it, but not soon. In other words, this is something that's going to happen in the future. A star has gone forth from Jacob, a staff arising from Israel crushing the prince of Moab, a bring the sons of Seth, basically something about a future person that's going to rise like a star and go forth like a staff, somebody that will be a leader and someone that is going to crush opposition and negativity, and the Jewish people will be once again restored. This is the nature of Balaam's prophecy. Okay, it's right over here. Let me check in with you and check in, make sure that makes sense. Makes sense so far? Yes. End of days, referring to some leader that's going to come. All right, good. Bye. Wait, I have a question. What's the city? What city? It says the remnant of the city. 
Um, remnant of the city. Uh, hold on one second. Let me open this up on my side. Um, the rulers shall come out of Jacob and destroy the remnant of the city. Uh, we'd have to look in the Mepharshim on this in the commentaries. Let's see. The remnant of the city. The civilization that we know now, does that, is that what it means? Oh, here, here, here we go, here we go. According to Rashi, it's Rashi. Rashi says he will liquidate the survivors. It refers to Edom. Edom, which is Rome, which is basically Seir, right? Edom shall be possessed. Seir shall become the possession of his enemies. Israel shall triumph. The remnant of the city refers to what we referred to previously, i.e. Edom, Seir, those places, which again were physical places, but refer to a concept that refers to the, um, if you will, the annihilation of mat materialism and the rise of, you know, materialism for the sake of materialism and the rise of a more spiritual, a more spiritual reality. Okay, but here's the deal. So this is, again, there's no super clear reference in the five books of Moses for the Messianic era. Now, there are lots of post five books of Moses prophecies, tons of Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah. You got tons of prophets. And they're, they're included, many of them are, are, the ones that I mentioned are included in the 24 books of scripture, Jewish scripture, holy books, all good and fine. Here's my point. The five books of Moses, the references to Mashiach are very slim. The clearest one is right here. What we, what's interesting though, although it seems very clear from Balaam introducing it by talking about the end of days and by the words of the prophecy being about a future star and a rod going out from Jacob and Israel, who is go going to like do all these things. It seems clear that it's referring to some sort of messianic figure. Nonetheless, Maimonides has a very interesting take. And so today what we're going to do is focus on the Maimonidean understanding of this prophecy. How does Rambam, Maimonides, understand Balaam's messianic prophecy it's interesting it's compelling and it holds a lot of lessons for you and i so i'm going to share my screen again let's jump back in and see rambam's own own words i call him rambam so in english you might call him maimonides in hebrew we call him rambam same guy so here's what he writes in his book called mishnah torah his book of jewish law at the end yes there are 12 chapters the, this is the opening of chapter 11 um, the last two chapters of the Laws of Kings, really the last two chapters of the entire work, 14 volumes, talk about the Messianic era and the person known as the Messiah, a.k.a. Mashiach. So take a look what he says here in text number two, and we are going to ask Ray, Ray, if you don't mind, to read. Um, there you go, if you can unmute and read. Yes, perfect. Read text number two. Um, it is even written in the Torah portion of Balaam, who prophesied about both the messianic, no, yes, both the both messiah. of the messiah, excuse me. The first messiah was David, who saved Israel from her adversities. The final messiah will be from his sons and will deliver Israel from the hands of his descendants of Esau. There it says, I see it, but not now. This refers to David. I behold it, but not soon. This is the King Messiah. A star has gone forth from Jacob. This is David. And a staff will arise from Israel. This is the King Messiah. This will crush the princes of Moab. This is David. And so it says, and he smote Moab and measured them <clears throat> with a rope and uproot all the sons of Seth. This is the king Messiah of when it says, and his dominion shall be from sea to sea. And Adam Edom shall be possessed. This is David, as it says, and Edom, Edom shall become slaves to David 
and Seir shall become the possession of his enemies. This is the King Messiah, as it says, and the Savior shall come upon Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau. Thank you. So this is a little bit of a complicated text. If we're being honest, this is a little bit of a complicated text. Just to simplify it, I want to simplify it. Um, essentially, what Maimonides does is he looks at, I'm going to scroll back. Sorry for scrolling back to text one. He looks at this, this text and he says that what it means is it's actually alternating the words of, of the prophet Balaam. They're actually alternating between two messiahs. Messiah number one, King David. You might, you might think to yourself, I never knew King David was a messiah. Well, that's what Maimonides calls him. Messiah number one, King David. And Messiah number two, Mashiach, the future redeemer. That's, that's, what, that's what Maimonides says. And he says that the, the verses are written in duplicate. Or there's two, two halves to each verse, pretty much. And the first half refers to David. The second half refers to the future Messiah. So a star has gone. I'm just going to highlight here. A star has gone forth from Jacob, David. A staff will rise from Israel, Mashiach. Crush the princes of Moab, David. Abrut the sons of Seth, Mashiach. Adam shall be possessed, David. Seah shall become the possession of his enemies, Mashiach. So he goes back and forth. He says the, the, the verses have, each verse has two parts. You have a star and a staff. You have Moab and Seth. You have Edom and Seir. Okay, so one is referring to David. The other one refers to Mashiach. And again, that's what Maimani says in text number two. He says it goes back and forth, right? David, Messiah, David, Messiah, David, Messiah, David, Messiah. That's it. That's what he says. So that's how Rambam understands the prophecy. It's not just talking about Mashiach. Balaam is not just talking about Mashiach. He's also talking about another Messiah. Or when I say Mashiach, we need the future redeemer. He's also talking about King David, who Maimonides also says is Mashiach. And by the way, Mashiach, can somebody tell me the literal translation of Mashiach? Mashiach, what does it mean? Mashiach, literal translation. Messenger. Uh, shliach, good. Shliach is messenger, but what is Mashiach? To draw out. Anointed one. Draw Anointed out. What one? else? Anointed one. Anointed one, good. Anointed. So we know that King David was literally anointed. All the Jewish kings were anointed. Now, there was one king before David that was anointed, Saul, but it didn't end well. It didn't really last so long. So the, the first Mashiach, the first one who's really anointed for uh, for a dynasty for this di for this um, monarch dynasty was King David. So so Maimonides says in the verses of the prophet Balaam that speak about the end of days, it's really David and Messiah. It's not just Messiah, Mashiach. It's David and King Messiah. By the way, there are others that disagree. There are others that say, no, all of those verses are only talking about Mashiach, the future redeemer. Forget who, who's talking about King David. I'll give you an example. Let me share my screen with you. And uh, let's jump inside to another version, another angle on this. This actually comes from the Midrash. Text number three. Okay, take a look at text number three, um, and let's ask, let us ask um, David. David, if you will, please read this text from the Midrash. Don't forget to unmute. There you go. Israel said uh, before, the, before the Holy One, blessed be he, master of the world, how long must be subjugated? He said to them, until the day comes about which it is said, a star has gone forth from Jacob and a staff will arise from Israel. When a star comes from Jacob and burns the straw of a south, from where do we know this will happen? As it says, and the house of Jacob will be as a fire, and the house of Joseph as a flame. The house of Asaph shall be straw, and they shall ignite, ignite them and consume them. 
said the Holy One, blessed be he, at the time I will manifest my kingship and reign over you, as it says, and the saviors shall come upon Mount Zion to judge the mountain of Asaph, and God shall have the kingdom. Perfect, thank you. So what we see from here, this is a medrash, it talks about the Jewish people saying, how long must we be subjugated? How long shall we be in exile? And God says, you'll be in exile, you'll be subjugated until the day comes about, about which is said, a star has gone forth from Jacob and a staff will arise from Israel. That's referring to Mashiach, the Messianic era. So the Medrash understands that both halves of the verse, I hope you understand the difference between Rambam now and the Medrash. Ra um, the, Medrash, the Midrash is saying that both parts of the verse, a star has gone forth from Jacob and a staff will rise from Israel, are referring to the Messianic era and the King, the King, King Mashiach, the, the Messiah. Uh, Maimonides understood, no, that a star has gone forth from Jacob is King David, and a staff will rise from Israel is, 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 is the Mashiach, but clearly the Midrash is not understanding that. The whole thing is a Messianic prophecy. So really the, the first question, the first core question that we have, is why does Maimonides choose to understand these verses in such a way that they're referring to not just Mashiach, but also King David? Like, why, why would Balaam be talking about King David? And why is it helpful for us, right? Assuming that that is the case, well, why is that helpful for us to have this juxtaposition between, between King David and Mashiach? Question makes sense? Yes, sort of. If we could just be talking about Mashiach, why, why mention King David? Where does King David come in? I want to share with you a few answers, and then we're going to go much deeper. So I'm going to give you two good answers, and then a third deeper answer. Answer number one. So there is this idea that you and I are supposed to anticipate the coming of Mashiach, right? You and I are supposed to anticipate the coming of the Messianic era, and the rise of the person known as Mashiach. And in order to help with this anticipation, it's good to know that it's happened before. It's good to know that it's happened before that there's been a leader who has you know, brought together the Jewish people and has led us in a way that uh, to our own sovereignty. It's good to know that we don't have to create something from scratch. It's really about... Um, a comeback tour, right? It's not putting the band together for the first time. It's it's a comeback tour, right? It's uh, it's happening again. Are you with me on the difference? Right. You tell me that something's going to happen for the first time. It's never happened before, but trust me, one day it's going to happen. You, you could be skeptical. I could be skeptical. Eh, who knows? Could be, maybe not. I don't know. How do you know it's ever going to happen? Never happened before. You're telling me that it's going to happen. I don't know. But you tell me that something that's already happened could happen again, totally makes sense, right? You know the expression, lightning doesn't hit the same place twice? Do you know that that's literally not true? That's, it's actually absolutely not true? Like Lightning doesn't strike twice? Are you kidding me? I'm not mistaken, the Empire State Building gets struck like dozens of times a year. It's like, oh, doesn't hit the same, 100% false. In other words, if lightning struck it once, it could very well strike it again, right? <laughs> so we had King David. We had a, an anointed king who, who fought the wars and gathered the people and, and, and led a harmonious re, um, uh, uh, kingdom of, of the Jewish people. So it could happen again. So that's why oh, it's Lord, beneficial... Lord. To have a juxtaposition of David and Mashiach, King David and Mashiach. Why? To remind us it's not a new thing. It's happening again. To illustrate this, I want to share the following Talmudic story. It's a great story. We're, by the way, we're currently doing a course on Talmudic stories. This, the course that we're on Tuesday nights, the course on Tuesday does not have this story, but this is a really cool story. All right, so take a look at this one. I think y'all are going to like it. All right, here we go. Um, Paul, if you don't mind, please read text. Uh, hold on. Text number five. 
Here we go. Take it away. A certain heretic said to Jephaha ben Pesisa, Woe unto you, the wicked, as you say, the dead will come to life. The way of the world is that those who are alive die. How can you say that the dead will come to life? Jehiva ben Peshesha said to him, Woe unto you, the wicked, as you say, the dead will not come to life. If those who were not in existence come to life, is it not reasonable all the more so that those who were once alive will come to life again? The heretic said to Jehiva ben Pesisa angrily, you're calling me wicked? If I get up, I will kick you and flatten your hump. As Jehiva ben Pesa was a hunchback, Jehiva ben Pesa said to him, if you do so, you will be called an expert doctor and you will be able to take high wages for your services. Thank you. So here we have this guy. I'm just going to call him Gavia. So Gavia says to this, sorry, sorry this, this heretic says to Gavia, he says, hey, listen, you're, you, you Jews, you guys are crazy. Why? Because he, he calls them wicked. Right? He says, one to you, the wicked. He's calling the Jews wicked, right? Because you have this belief in the resurrection of the dead. You say the dead will come to life. This guy says, are you kidding me? People that are alive die, not the other way around. When was the last time you saw the dead live? People that are, it's, it, it's a one-way street. It's life and then death, not death and then life. That's what this heretic argues to the Jew, to Gavir ben Pesisa. Upon which Gavia answers, you call me wicked, you're wicked, you're wrong, right? You say the dead will not come to life. He uses the opposite logic. He says, have you ever, have you ever thought about the miracle of childbirth, right? What happens with childbirth? There's no life, right? There's nothing. And then suddenly life. So if life can come out of nowhere, if those who are not in existence come to life, how much more reasonable is it that those who were alive will come back? In other words, what's easier to start from zero to get to 100 or to start from 50 to get to 100, right? What Are you with me on this, right? If nothing can become alive, then something that lived once could certainly come alive. It's good Jewish logic. And I'm going to tell you a joke soon about this. Um, but I just want to finish the story because it's kind of funny. I mean, I think it's funny. So this heretic says, you call me wicked now. Mind you, the irony, the, the, the logic is not lost here. This dude called him wicked. He calls him back wicked. But of course, says, how dare you call me wicked? It's like, I'm just using your words, but whatever. He says, I'm going to flatten your hump, your hunchback. He says, you know what? If you do so, call like a vote. Thank you very much, because <laughs> you'll be a great doctor. Anyway, that's how that story ends, kind of with a little bit of a, of a rabbi joke. Um, which reminds me of another rabbi joke. So it says that uh, these scientists, these doctors come to God one day and say, God, that's it. We don't need you anymore. You know, for a while we needed you. We really, we really needed you. Then we thought we needed you. Today, we don't even think we need you um, because we can actually create life in the laboratory. We don't actually need you. That's it. Science has figured out the secret to life and the mystery of creating life. So God says, really? Scientists say, yes. God says, okay, so let's have a creation contest. Okay, each of us are going to create, um, and we'll see if you can really create, if I can create, and whoever creates, whoever's the winner is, uh, is indeed. If you can create, call it a vote, more power to you, but let's just see. So what happens is um, uh, God says, let's do it old school, right? We're going to create life, human life, from the earth. The scientists say, no problem, we have that figured out as well, right? Adam was created from the earth, so we can also create now life from the earth. God says, okay, begin. And the scientists reach down, pick up a piece of earth, and God says, get your own earth. So here's the deal. Here is, that was the end of the joke, right? Get your own earth, that was the punchline. Um, essentially, it's easier to work with existing materials. <laughs> Dr. Maxi. Okay, so it's easier to work with existing materials. So you tell me that, that a person could be born out of nowhere, and that's reasonable, but the dead cannot be resurrected. That's unreasonable, 
Why? If, if life, life can come out of nowhere, then certainly life can come out of the remains of someone that was previously alive. That's, that's even more logical to say. Um, anyway, that's, that's the argument. The point is, the point, oh, one second. The point is, it's the same argument here regarding David and Mashiach. Right to tell me that we're going to have a messianic era and a king messiah, a, a messiah that's never happened before, and it's going to be like totally new. And but believe in it. All right, it's a little bit of a harder sell. But to tell me that no, we've had this before, King David. Look it up; it's in the history books. Right, we have the artifacts. King David, he led the people, created a Jewish sovereignty, and that's going to happen again. Much more reasonable, easier to believe, easier to wrap our heads around because it's already been done before. Like the Jewish belief in the resurrection of the dead. You tell me life out of nowhere, skeptical, right? Although we see it happen so many times. But life from, from previous existing life, even more reasonable. Um, I should mention parenthetically, we're starting a new course, brand new course, never taught this before, on the resurrection of the dead, starting a week from tomorrow night, Thursday night, July 1st. Mark your calendars. The course is called Resurrection of the Dead. Um, okay. So what we see here is answer. Yeah, Chaz and Ben, go. All right. So um, just, and, you know, I'm going in a little different direction, but uh, a few verses before what you're talking about, uh, Bill Alm says, says that there will arise a king greater, right? A greater than a god. Uh, uh, and he, and his reign will, Will reign. I mean, he will. His his kingship will become the the ruling, basically ruler of the world. Okay, and and so is that foretelling the coming of Mashiach as well, or is that just talking about David and Solomon? Good question. Good question. Let's see if I can find it. I don't have a. Um, in front it's of verse. Um, okay. The. Um, uh, verse number seven in in twenty four. So twenty four seven. Oh, look at that twenty four seven. Um. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Let's see. I've been studying it all day. Rabbi. Their first I king will that. triumph mm -hmm. over Agag, and their kingdom will be further exalted. Let's see what that's referring to. You know, there's different commentaries. I don't have all the commentaries in front of me. Oh, you know what? Interesting. According to Rashi, at least. It's referring to Shaul, to Saul, the first Jewish king. Yeah. Their king will triumph over Agag, refers to Saul, who vanquished Agag, king of Amalek, and the kingdom will be right. exalted. Oh, much. and the kingdom will be exalted, refers to that, David and Solomon. Yeah, yeah, I'm thinking that that um, beyond Rashi, um, that it really, I mean, if you really look at it, it really, historically, it refers to Solomon. David and Solomon. Yeah, so the, the second half, the kingdom will be even further exalted, he says, refers to David and Solomon as well. Yeah, yeah. but I, the, the core thing that we're trying to figure out is why is it that my that Maimonides, I mean, the, the, so so one could say, look, so that's talking about Saul or or David and Solomon. And so when 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 um, uh, Balaam or Bilaam, when the prophet pivots to the end of days, let it just be about Mashiach. Why does he, why does Rambam, why does Maimonides interject? No, David and Mashiach, David and Mashiach, David and Mashiach. Why David? And so there's this beautiful, again, the commentary say a beautiful idea. Oh, Mashiach is supposed to be a descendant of David. Obviously. Right, but why? Yeah, for sure. But why But why? Why does? Why do we have to say and th that the references of Mashiach are also referring to David? Even though, yes, of course, Mo, uh, Mashiach is from the Davidic dynasty. Why is that important? And so we have one answer that says that it's actually, right here. it helps with the Amuna. It helps with the faith and the belief in Mashiach. Because it's okay. one thing to believe that you know something's going to happen it's never happened before it's going to be cold it's going to be like out of nowhere out of the blue boom believe in it it's a little bit of a harder stretch it's a little bit of it stretches the amuna the faith the trust a little bit more a little a little bit further but you tell me that no it's david and mashiach in other words we have already a um a model for this. Uh, we've this we've established a dynasty yes exactly we, we have a precedent we have a we have a, a, a dynasty exactly so it's yeah. going to follow on the heels of that now that's already a little bit more understood so that's answer number one i'm going to give you answer number two and then we're going to go even deeper answer number two has to do with um the notion of also helping us believe 
in the coming of Mashiach. And to understand this, I'll tell you, give you an example. Somebody tells you, let me think of a good example. Somebody says that this week I'm going to send you, I'm going to, this week, I'm going to send you on Cash App $10. And next week, I'll send you another $10. Okay? Because, you know, because this or the other, I'm going to send you, you know, this uh, on Friday, I'm going to send you before Shabbos, I'll send you $10. And next Friday, another $10. Maybe, maybe not. But what happens when the first Friday they send you $10? So what are you thinking? Okay, so then I can probably count on the next $10. So because Ramba, Maimonides, understands this is referring to David and Mashiach, it again helps with the moon, it helps with the faith. Not just because it's been done before, but because half of the prophecy has been fulfilled. Right, understand this. Maimonides is saying that this is Balaam's prophecy 3,000 years ago, right? A thousand years or whatever it is, uh, maybe not a thousand, four or 500 years before King David was born, right? So now, what, what is Maimonides ha having us understand? That hundreds of years prior to David, this guy named Balaam was foretelling the rise of two great monarchies. The monarchy of David and the monarchy of Mashiach. One has already come to pass. Doesn't that help bolster the belief in the second, right? He's delivered. Uh, we, God has delivered on half the, the prophecy. Certainly the other half is not too far behind. This is the second approach. And this also is bolstered by a beautiful Talmudic story. I'm going to share my screen with you. and. Susan, if you don't mind reading this one, and hey Richard, it's good to see you. Let's um, let's take a look at text number six. Here we have Rabbi Moshe of Trani, who explains exact, well, hopefully exactly what I just shared with you. Okay, even Balaam prophesied of two Mashi Mashiachs about the first Mashiach, who was David, and about the last Mashiach, who will emerge from his progeny. Just as his prophecy was fulfilled with the first Mashiach, so will it be fulfilled with the last. And there we have this logic. And the logic helps bolster our faith in this future promise of redemption, right? Because Balaam told us about two Messiahs, two Mashiachs, David, and the future redeemer. So here's the logic, or here's, here's what helps our faith and our trust. Just as the prophecy was fulfilled with the first Mashiach, so will it be fulfilled with the last. So it's not just telling us that, oh, it's been done before, so it can happen again. More so, the first half has already been fulfilled. The second half is around the corner. This okay. is, this, this concept is also found in this really powerful story. I'm going to read this. It's a long story. I'm going to read the story. Text number seven. All right. Take a look at text number seven. One second. Take a look at text number seven. This is coming from Talmud Tractate Makot 24b. This is referring to after the destruction of the second holy temple in the year 69 of the common era. So after its destruction, there were, there was a group of rabbis, great rabbis who were walking along the area of where the temple once stood. Take a look at this dramatic story. Yet again, they, group, the group of rabbis, were climbing the hills toward Jerusalem together. And once they had crested Mount Scopus, they tore their clothing as a halachic sign of mourning. I'm going to explain that also. Basically, it says in Jewish law that when one encounters a, tr a, a painful loss, one is meant to tear their garments, to tear their clothes as a sign of mourning. We call it kriya. It's, in a, it's, it's, a, it's an important halachic mandate when one is in a state of mourning and grieving a loss. It's not only for a loved one. It says when one beholds the destruction of the temple, one is also meant to tear one's clothing. So here they were literally in the aftermath of the temple's destruction. They were climbing the hills. And they, they, they saw the area where the temple once stood. They, they tore their clothes. 
once you don't have to, you make a tear in the shirt and, and okay. Once they had reached the Temple Mount, listen to this, they saw a fox emerging from the place where the Holy of Holies had once stood. Can you imagine where the temple once stood? It's in ruins and you see a fox just you know, running out from the rubble. So they started to weep. The rabbi started to weep. But Rabbi Akiva laughed. If you don't know, Rabbi Akiva is one of the greatest sages of the Mishnah and the Talmud. Rabbi Akiva was like a top-level sage. He is one of the most famous rabbis in all of Jewish history. And here he did something very surprising. Seeing the ruins of the temple, seeing a fox, you know, meandering around in that holy place, they all cry, but he laughs. Why are you laughing? They demanded. Why are you weeping? He replied. They lamented. A place of which it is said in the common man that draws near shall be put to death has now become the haunt of foxes. Should we not weep? Right? It's a Jewish answer because it's rhetorical. Um, but they said, look, look, when the temple stood, no one's allowed to go there unless you're a priest, unless you're a Kohen. And now foxes are running around. Oh, if you're a Palestinian, you can go there anywhere. Listen, we're not we're not getting uh, we're not we're not uh, jumping. Sorry, I had to put that in. Uh, Middle East conversation. But here's the point: right. they they um, they're crying because look a desecration. Look what's happening. It's now the haunt of foxes. Should we not cry? Take a look at what Rabbi Akiva says. Listen to this. He replied. This is precisely why I am laughing. For it is written. Listen to this verse. This verse comes from, hold on. Let me look at my sources. This comes oh, yeah. from Isaiah. It says in Isaiah as follows. Um, and I will take to me faithful witnesses to record, to record, sorry. I will take to me faithful witnesses to record. Uriah, the priest, and Zechariah, Zechariah, the son of Jeberachiah. Now, what is the connection between Ur Uriah the priest and Zechariah? Uriah lived during the times of the first temple, whereas Zechariah lived during the second temple. So how, why are they put together in the same verse, right over here? Why are they put together in the same verse? Nevertheless, the holy writings have linked the latter prophecy of Zechariah with the earlier prophecy of Uriah. In the early prophecy of Uriah, it is written, therefore, because of you, Zion shall be plowed as a field. That is the earlier prophecy. In Zechariah, the latter prophecy, it is written, there shall yet be a time when old men and old women will sit in the promenades of Jerusalem. In other words, it talks about a future return and rebuilding of the temple, Jerusalem, its renaissance, etc. So Rabbi Akiva says, so long as Uriah's prophecy has not yet been fulfilled, in other words, as long as Zion had not been plowed as a field, desecrated, totally and utterly demolished, demolished, I had misgivings lest Zechariah's prophecy might also not be fulfilled literally, right? If, if the first prophecy, if the two prophecies we know from a third verse, the two prophecies are linked. So the first prophecy talks about its destruction. It's, it's very, um, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Very... Um, Desecrated desecration. It's very desecrated. Um, and, 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 and the second prophecy talks about the, 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 the return to Jerusalem, the rebuilding of the temple. So as long as the first one wasn't, as long as the desecration wasn't literal, then maybe the return wouldn't be literal. So that was his misgivings. He wasn't sure. But now that Uriah's prophecy has been literally fulfilled, it is certain that Zechariah's prophecy will also find its literal fulfillment. So now that basically, I'm going to say it in my own words. So um, Rabbi Akiva sees a fox, right? They all saw a fox emerging from the place where the Holy of Holies once stood. So, King, so Rabbi Akiva essentially says, if it's so bad, if it's so desecrated, then I know that it's going to be better. I know there's, if that prophecy, if the prophecy, if the negative prophecy has been fulfilled to the full degree, then I know the positive prophecies will also be fulfilled to the full to the full degree because they are linked. Um, uh, they replied. So the other rabbis, his his colleagues, replied with the following words: Akiva, you have comforted us. Akiva, you have comforted us. In other words, you have given us comfort. You have given us solace. 
you've given us faith in that the temple will once again be restored, Jerusalem will once be restored, and we will be back once again in its full, and, and, and everything will be in its full glory. That is the story. This is one of the, it is a pretty famous story from the Talmud, especially with regards to the temple's destruction and belief in Mashiach. Um, what's the point here? The point is here that, that you have linked prophecies. And when you have linked prophecies, well, when one link gets triggered, when one gets activated, you know, the other one is going to happen as well, right? If the same prophecy, if it has two parts and one half gets fulfilled, you can assume with, with pretty strong certainty that the other half is also going to be fulfilled. So if destruction was fulfilled, then rebuilding will be fulfilled. Getting back to the point here with David and, and Mashiach. If Balaam, the prophet, talks about the rise of two future kings, one King David, the other King Mashiach, the Messiah, and one was fulfilled, you can be assured, as Rav Moshe Trani says, that the other one will also be fulfilled. This bolsters our emuna. This bolsters our bitachan, our faith and our trust in Mashiach. So this answers our question, but we're going to go deeper. The question was, just to reset the question, the question is, we know that Balaam clearly is talking about end of days. Maimonides understands the verses to be as a back and forth between referring to David and Mashiach. Why not make it simple? Why not just say it's referring to Mashiach? Why go David, Mashiach, David, Mashiach, David, Mashiach? We have two answers. One, to remind us that Mashiach is not brand new. We've had it before, not the full measure, but more or less, we had a king, we had a sovereignty, we had a monarchy, we had security and safety and, and, and spiritual flourishing. We had that. So we, it can happen again. It's not, out of, it's not outlandish, number one. Number two, even more so, there were two prophecies. One was fulfilled. The other one also will be fulfilled. And that gives us certainty in the coming of Mashiach. So we could answer that why does Rambam, why does Maimonides choose to understand the verses and the prophecies referring to both David and Mashiach as a framework of bolstering our emuna, our faith, and our trust in the coming of Mashiach. I hope that makes sense. But we're going to go deeper. And to go deeper, we're going to take a look at another question. Because although some of this makes sense, some of this is still a little bit uncomfortable. And here's what I mean. You want to tell me that, you know, Mashiach is in the mold of the first redeemer. There's already been a redeemer and Mashiach is not going to be the first time we've had a redeemer. It's been done before. So who should we be talking about? David? Who is the first redeemer of the Jewish people? Help me out here. Who is the first redeemer? If you use the word oh, redeemer. Moshe, Moshe. 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 So if, if the agenda of Maimonides, right, if his objective is to give us kind of a framework of belief in Mashiach saying it's not new, it's been done before, right? So why not, why not reference Moses, right? Mo King David wasn't a redeemer. Who did he, how did he redeem the Jewish people? What, they were slaves? They were in exile? They weren't in exile. Moses did that. Moses took the Jewish people, of course, with God's help, out of Egyptian exile. So that's really a more direct parallel to Mashiach, to the Messiah, right? We were in exile then. Moses took us out. We're in exile now. Mashiach will take us out. So why David and Mashiach? The connection should be Moses and Mashiach. That's question number one. Question number two, which is a bit of a more technical question, but maybe a broader question, is why is any of this in the Mishnah Torah? Why is any of this in, in Maimonides' book of Jewish law? How this whole, The whole analysis of Balaam's prophecy, King David, Mashiach, King David, Mashiach, what, the whole thing doesn't have a place in, in, in Rambam, in, in the book of Halacha, and I'll tell you why. Take a look at what Rambam writes himself about his book. Hold on. This is, okay, we, I'm skipping this text. This is a midrash that juxtaposes Moses and Mashiach. Moses went on a donkey. Mashiach will go on a donkey. Moses brought down mana. Um, Mashiach will bring down mana. Moses brought up water. Mashiach will bring up water. Okay, fine. So that was the question number one. The question number two is now regarding why is it in a book of halacha? I'm going to read this, text number nine. Here's how Maimonides introduces us 
to his book of uh, Mishnah Torah, to his book of laws. He writes, this is straight from his intro. Therefore, I girded my loins. I, Moses, the son of Maimon of Spain. I relied upon the rock, that's referring to God, blessed be he. I contemplated all these texts and sought to compose a work that would include the conclusions derived from all these texts regarding the forbidden, the permitted, the impure, and the pure, and the remainder of the Torah's laws, all in clear and concise terms, so that the entire oral law could be organized in each person's mouth without questions or objections. Essentially, what Rambam says is that he is compiling all of Jewish law into an easily read, very clearly organized book or series of 14 books series of books, basically an encyclopedia of Jewish law, organized by topic, clearly written for everyone to understand. Fantastic. So you know what Rambam doesn't do? He doesn't give us commentaries on verses. He doesn't throw us midrashim, right? Midrashic analysis. He doesn't do it. What does he do? He tells us the law. So here's the question. If he's telling us the law, why does he start expounding upon the verses of Balaam's prophecy. This is referring to David. This is referring to Mashiach. This is David. This is Mashiach. Very nice. Very nice. Very nice commentary. But what's where's the law? What's the halacha? What's, what's the law here? I want to share with you. We have just five minutes left. So I'm going to share with you very quickly. I'm going to try to summarize a beautiful insight that the Rebbe taught on this. The Rebbe explains why it is, addressing our last, our final question, why it is that any of this, the prophecy of, of Balaam, why is any of this in Rambam's book of law? And the Rebbe says as follows. It's easy to have a misconception about the whole deal with Mashiach. It's very easy to think that, well, what is Mashiach? What is the Messianic era? It's a time of, you know, just blessings and prosperity and goodness. And who is Mashiach? some sort of miracle worker, right? So it's all about like abundance and good things and living like vacation life and having everything you need with a miracle worker who's going to do whatever, you know, provide everything and anything. And that's what Mashiach is. That is the fantasy of Mashiach that one might have, you know, reading various prophecies and not understanding them correctly. A genie so in a bottle. A genie, yeah, a genie in a bottle. What do you want? Good, I like that. A genie in a bottle. What are your wishes? Bring exactly. It's like a genie. So, what are your three wishes? <laughs> what do you want? Right. So, and what do you want? You want you want candy growing on trees? Done. What do you want? A fleet of Teslas? Done. It's like that's Mashiach, a miracle worker with with all these things. It's much more than that. What is Mashiach? According to Rambam, again, this is why it's in Halacha, because Rambam is clarifying the Gedarim, the, the, the framework of Mashiach. Maimonides tells us, and we're going to have, we're, I'm going to show you the, 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 the text soon. Maimonides clarifies that Mashiach is not a miracle worker. He might also do miracles, but that's not an essential job um, qualification. Or, uh, yeah, he doesn't need to perform miracles to be Mashiach. Mashiach is simply, I don't want to uh, reduce it too much, but Mashiach is essentially someone who is committed to Torah mitzvot and leading the Jewish people back to a renaissance of Judaism. That is essentially what Mashiach is. Yes, the era is good for everybody and there's blessings. All of that is true also, but the core of the identity of Mashiach and the role of Mashiach is to bring a renaissance back to Judaism. That is the core role of Mashiach. So where do we see this in Maimani's writings? Here you go. Take a look, text 10. This is in Mishnah Torah. Do not presume that the Messianic king must work miracles and wonders. I just literally told you this. Do not presume that he's a miracle worker or bring about new phenomena in the world or resurrect the dead or perform other similar deeds. This is definitely not true. Um, proof can be brought from the fact that Rabbi Akiva, who we mentioned before, one of the greater sages of the Mishnah, was one of the supporters of King Bar Koziba and would describe him as the Messianic king. He and all the sages of his generation considered him, King Koziba, uh, Bar Koziba, to be the Messianic king until he was killed because of his sins. Once he was killed, they realized he was not the Messiah. The sages did not ask him for any signs or wonders. That is not a criteria or qualification 
uh, pre-existing qualification of Mashiach. The main thrust of the matter is this Torah, its statutes and its laws are everlasting. We may not add to them or detract from them. In other words, what he's trying to say is Mashiach is all about the Torah. Mashiach is all about Judaism. Mashiach is all about a renaissance of Judaism. Take a look at how Maimonides describes who Mashiach is. If Mashiach is not a miracle worker, so then who is Mashiach? Here he goes. If a king will arise from the house of David, who diligently, look the first criteria, diligently contemplates the Torah and observes its, its, observes its mitzvot, as prescribed by the written law and the oral law, as David, his ancestor, did, we'll get to that in a second, and will compel all of Israel to walk in the way of Torah and will rectify the breaches in its observance and will fight the words of God, we may with assurance consider him the Messiah. If he succeeds in the above, builds the temple in its place and gathers the dispersed of Israel, he is definitely the Messiah. He will then improve the entire world, motivating all the nations to serve God together. As the verse states, I will transform the peoples to a pure language that they will all call upon the name of God and serve him with one purpose. What is the point? The point is very simple. Mashiach is not a genie in a bottle. I like that. Mashiach is not a miracle worker. Mashiach is not necessarily. Mashiach is not hocus pocus magician. Mashiach is someone committed to Torah, someone committed to the mitzvot, someone inspiring that inspires others, brings the Jewish people back together under God, under Torah, etc., and inspires the whole world to find and dedicate themselves in their own way to Hashem. That is literally what the Rambam says in the halachas, the hilchot, the laws of Mashiach. This is not a drash, it's not homily, it's not commentary. This is Mishnah Torah, Laws of Kings, chapter 11, number four in his book of law. He talks about who Mashiach is and what Mashiach's role is. And therefore, based on Rambam's understanding of who Mashiach is, that's why Rambam cites the verses from our Torah portion and cites the commentary of that it's referring to all alternating. It's referring to David and the Messiah, David and the Messiah to bring out the close connection. And let me explain. It's not just because it's easier to believe. It's not just because half of the deal has, half of the promise has already been kept. It's much more than that. Who was King David? Why aren't we referring to Moses? Because Moses did not unite the Jewish people under all of Torah and mitzvot. And you're wondering, what do you mean? Didn't Moses help us get the entire Torah? Yes, but we didn't do all of the mitzvot under Moses. Why not? Why not? Because we weren't in the land of Israel. And the majority of Jews were not living in the land of Israel because no one was living in the land of Israel. You didn't have Israel. You didn't have, so you had a, a bunch of laws that weren't kept. And then after Moses was Joshua and after Joshua were the various judges. And it's still, they were fighting wars. It wasn't settled until the times of King David, who finally ended, for, for at least for a time period, finally put the chaos to an end and returned strength or brought strength to the Jewish nation and the Jews finally lived under one monarch, united under Jewish law, under Torah law. And it was at that point that the Jews were finally able to keep all of Torah and all of the mitzvot. And really, you know, we talk about peak Judaism, that was peak Judaism. And thus Maimonides says, that's, what, that's why Maimonides draws the parallel, the continuous parallel in the verses between David and Mashiach, David and Mashiach to remind us who Mashiach is and what Mashiach is about. Mashiach is not about miracles and candy growing on trees and free Teslas for all. That's not, and, 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 and you know, canceling student debt. That's not what Mashiach is, although that's also a good thing. That's not Mashiach, right? Although it might be Messianic, it's not Mashiach. Who is Mashiach? Mashiach is about the spiritual stuff. It's about, for Jews, it's about the Jewish stuff. For everyone, it's about the godly stuff. Mashiach is about, for Jews at least, is about Judaism. It's about Torah, it's about mitzvot. That's what Mashiach is. And thus the closest parallel we have, the, press, the closest precedent we have is King David. King David who united the Jewish people, got a solid Jewish sovereignty thing going and was able to preside over the first time when, Jewish, when Judaism could really be performed in its full measure. So I want to share with you, let me just share with you a text or two from the Rebbe and we'll close it out. 
take a look at Take a look at text. I'm going to share my screen with you very quickly, and then we're going to close it out. Um, this is going to be text number 13. Maimonides' words are, it is even written in the Torah portion of Balaam who prophesied about both the messiahs. The first messiah was David, who saved Israel from her ad uh, uh, adversities. The final messiah will be from his sons will deliver Israel in the end of days. From here, we know that the consequence of the Messiah and the point of the Messiah is to renew the Davidic dynasty, right? The Rebbe says it's all about renewing the Davidic dynasty and restore it to its initial sovereignty. In this sense, he is the final Messiah vis-a-vis -vis the first Messiah who was David. So Moses wouldn't help us. We need the juxtaposition with David. All right, I'm going to skip the rest of that, of that quote. And here we have the final point, text 14, the Messiah will bring about the complete fulfillment of the Torah by being liberated from domination by foreign powers. On the contrary, the Messiah will reign over them. We will be able to properly occupy ourselves with Torah and mitzvot and be free to be involved in the Torah and wisdom without any pressures or disturbances, as Maimonides writes at length elsewhere. So what is the point of all this? The point is that what is Mashiach? We believe in Mashiach. We want Mashiach. But what is Mashiach? Mashiach is about a return of Judaism to its perfection, to its ultimate, the ultimate perfect state of Judaism and Jewish identity and Jewish connection and divine connection. So for Jews, it's, it means one thing. For the rest of the world, it means something else. But it means the max spiritual connection possible. And so, my friends, as we think about, as we think about Mashiach, as we think about the Messianic era, as we think about the prophecies and the promises of Mashiach, as we think about the Anamam and the 13 principles of faith, which include faith, uh, principle number 12, belief in Mashiach, I await his coming every single day. Let us recall, let us remember that it's not just about the physical promises and the blessings. They will be there also, but it's really about the spiritual stuff. And that gives us an interesting insight, which is the practical takeaway, which is you want Mashiach? Well, you and I can have a taste of that at any time that we so choose. At any time that we so choose, you and I can commit ourselves in this moment to studying some Torah or to doing a mitzvah, helping out someone else in need. And in doing so, we are living Mashiach in this moment. If Mashiach is about Torah and mitzvot, so every time we study Torah, every time we do a mitzvah, we have a taste of Mashiach. Imagine if I told you you're invited to like the highest level, like high class, super fancy schmancy dinner party. And at this dinner party, it's going to have the finest kosher, obviously, kosher caterer in the land, in the world, the finest caterer. You're like, wow, I can't wait till this party. And then I tell you, but you know what? Even before the party, I have some samples. Do you want to try some? What are you going to say? Hook me up. Absolutely. Give me some of the goods. I'll take it. I'll take two. I'll take, what do you have? I can't, I'm salivating, right? Give me the food. Can't wait. Even though you know that the full, the full banquet has not yet arrived. In a similar way, Mashiach is not here yet. But every mitzvah, if Mashiach means perfection, right? Being able to connect and be in a relationship with God in its purest measure, no distractions, purely connected, you and I can taste that at any time that we choose. At any time we choose, we can open up a text and study some Torah, whether it's, you know, in a printed form or in a digital form, audio or video, doesn't make a difference. You and I can do a mitzvah at any time. There's always a mitzvah to do somewhere, right? You do a mitzvah, and in those moments, connect fully with God. May we taste from the banquet, right? The banquet food, you, you have access to the kitchen. They're setting the tables, but you're in the kitchen. You can taste straight from, from the chef. You can have some taste. So what are you going to go for, right? What are you going to go for? The sushi. The caviar, the roast beef, the uh, the brisket, the I don't know, chvesnish, right? The sous -vide. the sous vide, right? What are you gonna go for, right? <laughs> go for the gold, whatever it is, it's gonna be good, cause it's <laughs> the master of all master chefs. So here's how I want to end. I want to end with a lechaim. I don't have anything in front of me other than Lacroix. But you know what? It's also I'll drink good. one for you, Rabbi. <laughs> 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 to tasting, to enjoying and indulging 
in our connection with Hashem in a good way, spiritual indulgence, to enjoy the connection, the opportunities that we have to do things that are meaningful, let us say, l'chaim together. So all all sorts of different drinks. All right, right, that's it for tonight. Um, So a few quick announcements before we close it out. Announcement number one is, um, don't forget, next Thursday night, you know what I'm going to do? Because I see that you guys really want to see this information. I could just tell it on all your faces. I can, I can read the, I can read the room, right? Even if you don't know that you want it, I know that you definitely you want, want to see it. this, right? Right. This is for sure. What everyone. The sign of a great leader, knowing what we want, even when we can't verbalize it. See that? See that? So here's what this is. It's called Resurrection of the Dead a new three-part online series on radical eternal life drawn from classic and spiritual Jewish wisdom. This is our brand new course. It is starting um, next Thursday night at 8 p.m. online. Sign up on the website intownjewishacademy.org slash resurrection. Join us. It's going to be a great course. I have taught about the resurrection of the dead in courses before. We had a little bit of a mention in our um, last JLI course on Mashiach, we've had it in our um, uh, afterlife courses, you know, maybe a class or a half a class on it. This is going to be three sessions with brand new material that we've never taught before, that I've never taught before on the topic. So if you want a really comprehensive look at the resurrection of the dead, then join me for this. It is really a profound topic. It's not about the soul living on forever. It's about the body, literally the body coming back um, um, coming back to life. Take a look, not take a look. I'm going to open up the webpage myself um, just to give you the three topics. Uh, the first session, the title is called Flesh Over Spirit. Um, the second session is called Discovering Your Deepest Self. And the third session is called Quantum Leap. Join me for that. It's going to be a great course. I think everyone's going to enjoy it. Um, yeah. All right. That's it. Um, other announcements, we have an event, oh, a really cool event happening in July, July 13th. It's called Archaeological Secrets of, wait, I should know what it's called. It's called Archaeological, oh, sorry, The Archaeological Claim to Jerusalem, Revealing Secrets Some Do Not Want You to Know. You know, you might have noticed that there's a lot of questions about the Jewish claim to the land of Israel. You may have seen it in the news. Right, people say that uh, Jews may not have a right to the land of Israel. I, some people may be saying that. Um, anyway, we're going to be looking at the at at science. You know, everyone's about the science. It's all about science. Okay, okay. How do you know about science of history? How do you prove history? You dig, and what you find underground is scientific. It's evidence, right? That's evidence. So we're going to look at the evidence. We have the Jewish Indiana Jones with us. It's going to be a virtual event. We had him last year. He's great. His name is Rabbi Avram Stalik. He lives in Florida, but he is an expert in Israeli archaeology and archaeological finds. He's going to, it's visual. He's got like PowerPoints and and images and video. He's going to show us the incredible discoveries under the holy city of Jerusalem that point to the Jewish connection to the land. You might be thinking it's obvious, or maybe you're thinking, did they find anything new that I don't know about? There's only one way to find out, and that is by joining us July 13th to find incredible discoveries under the Holy City. All right, with that. Married, married to a Pittsburgher? Uh, no, not oh. married to a Pittsburgher. I don't believe, no, 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 that's, that's his brother. That's his brother. His brother is not Indiana Jones, not the Jewish Indiana Jones. His brother is, yeah, just, just a rabbi. Just a rabbi like the rest of us. Um, okay. Any questions or comments? So, so before we leave, I, I need to say two things. Number one, I've been watching your mother shepping nachas from you all night long. And I want you to know it's the best part of what you do is really great. But the greater part is that your mother Shops so much nachas from you, and thank you, thank you. For I, I want to tell you, it's just halavai of 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 Okay, thank and you. 
Okay, the second thing is a question. And, and the question is that you have taught me and Rabbi Schusterman has taught me that, that the, the third temple is going to be built for the Rabbi Nishalayim, according to mystic texts. And so tonight, what you taught us was that Mashiach is going to bring the building of the third temple. Yes. It was part of your lesson tonight. Yes. Good question. And so my Shaila is, if Mashiach is going to build the temple, how's the Rabbi Nishalayim fit in? Who be, excellent? Thank Who you for asking. Question that? Good question. So the question is, that who built the third temple? Huh? That was my question. That was my question. There you go. <laughs> you guys are in cahoots. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> right. So the question is, no, who we didn't do it behind your back. Believe me, all right, it's all, all up right. front. <laughs> who knows? You can message each other. No, listen. So the question is, who who built the temple? Is it God? Does it come down? Is it Yor and Mamila? Does it come down from Shemayim? You know, in a blaze of fire, or is it built right. by Mashiach? Here's the deal. I'll Rambam, Rambam, Ra <laughs> Maimonides, the answer is at the bottom. No, Maimonides clearly says, <laughs> Maimonides clearly says that Mashiach builds the temple, builds the base of Mikdash, builds the temple. But you do have other sources to talk about it coming from above. So I can tell you this that until it happens, I don't know. <laughs> There's different ways of understanding it. I've heard, I've seen some people reconcile it as follows. The majority of it will be built on high. Mashiach will put the last pieces together. So it's considered, you know, Makabe Patish, right? Makabe Patish. No, finish so, the Sefer Torah. Finish or finish, put up the gates, put up the doors. So in Halacha and Jewish law, there's a prohibition on Shabbos against building, but there's also about putting in the final nail. Because when you put in the final nail, when you when you hammer in the last piece, it's like you built it. Even if all you did was the last piece, but before that, it wasn't a, it wasn't a home. And now because of that, it is a home. So that constitutes already building. And so we could say that Mashiach is the Makkabah path that she does the last little bit. And because of the, the hammering, the final nail in, that's considered as if he built it. That's one. I've seen that answer. I'm not telling you for sure what's going to happen. I'm just telling you an answer that I've seen. It's a good question. I've also seen an answer give, being given that it's like the, um, it's like the, the machloket or whatever, like the contradiction that we find regarding Mashiach himself, the Messiah himself. Does he come in riding on a donkey, like we read tonight, or on Anani HaKavod on the clouds? No, which one is it? Is he on the donkey? Right, is he driving a, um, hold on, let me get a good one. What's that car, a Pinto? Remember the Pinto, right? Yeah. Is he driving a Pinto? <laughs> Weren't those the cars that exploded? Am I wrong here? Yeah. You yes. Maybe he should not be riding a Pinto. They had the gas <laughs> tank yes, in the back. Yes, they were the ones yes. that exploded. They caught on fire. They had yes. gas tank in the back. And so if you really the somebody, the whole thing would blow up. Firestone tires to put on their Pinto as in the day. That's crazy. That's almost like putting a battery under your car. Wait, I'm kidding. I'm only in jest. All right, back to Tesla. So here's the point. So he's he, he could either be driving a Pinto or a um oh, what's that really expensive car? A um Bentley. No, Maserati. Huh? Lamborghini. Maserati. Lamborghini. Maserati. Maserati. Go to Maserati, right? Like a really so which one is it? So one of the ways that we answer this question in, uh, in not we, but one of the way the question is answered in, 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 the, in the good books, and we actually did mention this in the Mashiach course that we just finished, is there's a question of zachu or lo zachu. Like if the Yidin, if the Jewish people are meritorious, they could bring it early with a lot of, you know, extra super duper miracles. If it runs its normative course, then it's, it's um, oh, be'ita achishena. It's either on time or it's sooner. So if it's sooner, that means that we really did a good job and we get extra perks. If it's in its time, it means that it's, you know, the, the basic how it's meant to be. Again, it's, I'm, not, I'm not predicting. I'm just telling you thoughts that are out there. So one could say the same thing. If, it's, if we bring it sooner and whatever, so maybe the Abisha builds it. Maybe it comes from on high. But if it's more of like in its time and more of a normative progress, then maybe Mashiach builds it. Anyway, as Maimonides says, I'll just quote Maimonides to, to kind of wrap this piece up of the discussion. 
a lot of things about this. We won't know until it happens. But until then, we will be eagerly anticipating its arrival. All right, so let's close it out. We'll let everybody go. So, so I need to just, just because you were talking about driving. So, so one of my wonderful previous rabbis that I had the privilege to work with, whose name is Jack, Jack Reamer, who is, may he live long and be well. Uh, as he says, um, uh, Ad, Ad mea ke'esrim, uh, that's what he taught me, but but um, he was the worst driver I have ever, ever driven with and scared me to death every time I drove with him. We were on the way to a funeral and he drove at the last time that I would drive with him. And he said, um, Ben, I'll get you to that funeral one way or another. <laughs> <laughs> but, but then he finished and he said, you have nothing to worry about because Shomer Pesayim Hashem. <laughs> so you watches, can you can you can translate that, Rabbi. Hashem watches over the reckless. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Anyway, good, beautiful story. Thank I like you that so line. much for tonight. You'll, it was you'll be wonderful. you'll be in the cemetery one way or another. All right, my friends. Um, not you. I'm saying that's what he said. I'm just <laughs> translating the story. All right, friends. Uh, and if you want to know, is it possible to get out? Right in a cemetery, everyone's dying to get in. But can you get out? So that is the topic of next week's class, The Resurrection of the Dead, about coming back. So, Let my friends, it's it. great to see you all. I'm going to sign off. Lila Tov. And Thank you. we'll see you all. Take care, everybody.